One of the truly great and inspiring teachers was a man by the name of William Lyons Phelps. He was a professor at Yale University for about, oh, I'd guess 40 years. He was also a literary critic and the author of a great many fine things. He was loved by everyone who knew him, and he died in 1943 at the age of 78. I was poking around in my library looking for something worth sharing with you when I came across a little short thing that William Lyons Phelps had written called One Day at a Time. I think it's terrific, and it goes like this. We look backward too much, and we look forward too much. Thus we miss the passing moment. The fear of life is the favorite disease of the 20th century. Too many people are afraid of tomorrow. Their happiness is poisoned by a phantom. Many are afraid of old age, forgetting that even if they should lose their bodily vigor, weakness itself may minister to the development of the mind and spirit. In the words of the aged poet Waller, the soul's dark cottage, battered and decayed, let in new light through chinks that time has made. Stronger by weakness, wise men become as they draw near to their eternal home. Let the scientists worry about our origin, he wrote. Let the prophets worry about our future, the decline of Western civilization and whatnot. Some people are alarmed because in 9,000 billion years the sun's fuel may give out. Instead of chagrin over our past and alarm over our future, suppose we consider our opportunity. Listen to Emerson. Write in on your heart that every day is the best day in the year. No man has earned anything rightly until he knows that every day is doomsday. Today is a king in disguise. Today always looks mean to the thoughtless in the face of a uniform experience that all good and great and happy actions are made up precisely of these blank todays. Let us not be deceived. Let us unmask the king as he passes. Well, I think Dr. Phelps, with an assist from Emerson, have well made a point worth making. If we could only get out of bed each morning realizing that today is a day not unlike those on which the greatest and most exciting events of history have taken place, that today represents another opportunity on the road to whatever greatness it is we seek, and that finally today will take its place as a single tile in the mosaic of our finished life, to either add to its beauty and harmony or detract from it, or lose itself in a dull gray background of an uninteresting, unchallenged, undedicated existence. I particularly liked Emerson's admonition to know that today could be the last which makes it important and that today is a king in disguise. Let us not be deceived. Let us unmask the king as he passes. And above all, don't be frightened about tomorrow, but concern yourself with the eternal present. A man named Richmond wrote, There is a time to be born and a time to die, says Solomon, and it's the memento of a truly wise man. But there is an interval between these two times of infinite importance. Among the writings of Henry David Thoreau, I came across this statement. Many an object is not seen, though it falls within the range of our visual ray, because it does not come within the range of our intellectual ray. In other words, there are many things that exist in our world that we don't see because we're not looking for them or perhaps even capable of looking for them. So in the largest sense, the world we see is only the world we look for. Show two people the same picture and each will see a different scene. Each will extract from what he sees that which he happens to be predisposed to look for. Different people looking out of a train window as they pass through the outskirts of a city will see the same thing from entirely different viewpoints. One will see a depressing, run-down neighborhood. Another will see an ideal plant site. Still another might see a marvelous opportunity for real estate development. The passing scene might give someone else an idea for a story or a song or a poem. Another, his face buried in a magazine, will see nothing. The world presents to each of us every day that which we seek. There's not a neighborhood or area that doesn't offer abundant opportunity to every person there. That opportunity is limited only by the viewpoint of the inhabitant. Some years ago, a Wisconsin farmer was stricken with polio and left paralyzed in an iron lung. Flat on his back, unable to farm his land, he was forced to push back his intellectual horizon. He was forced to think creatively, to take mental inventory of his assets and liabilities. Without moving from his bed, he built one of the country's largest and most successful meatpacking companies. Unable to use his hands and feet, he was forced to use his most precious 
his most priceless possession, his mind, and he found his farm contained all the riches he and his family would ever need. Where before there was only a farm, now there are great packing plants employing thousands. I'm sure that when his friends and neighbors learned of his affliction, they wondered how he would manage to operate his farm and care for his family. He simply looked at the farm with new eyes. He saw what he had failed to see before, even though nothing had changed except his own mobility. Every one of us lives in a kind of iron lung of his own fashioning. Each one of us has opportunities just as great as that Wisconsin farmer's. But few of us are forced to reach so far into the deep reservoirs of ability within us. And fewer still know the joy and excitement and never-ending interest that can be found in our daily lives when we learn to look at our world as Thoreau looked at his. Surrounded by miracles and limitless opportunity, some people manage to find only boredom and insecurity. As Thoreau said, we find only the world we look for. One time when I was in New York City, my plane was canceled because of mechanical difficulties. More than a hundred of us, I suppose, were now left to scramble for another flight to our destinations on a busy, crowded afternoon. I went back to the counter, and a woman told me there was another flight in just an hour. But won't that be filled, I asked. Well, maybe not, she said. I thought of all the people who had been canceled out on my flight, fighting for seats on the next one, which was already probably completely booked, and... I toyed with the idea of staying overnight and making a new reservation for the following morning. Why don't you try it, she said. The thought of standing around the airport for another hour only to be turned away from a full flight was very unappealing. Do you think there's any hope at all, I asked. Try it, she said. So I tried it, and I wound up with a window seat up front and was only an hour late arriving at my destination. If I hadn't tried it, I would have had to taxi all the way back into the city, register at a hotel, spend the night, and repeat the whole process the next day. I'd been saved all that by a woman who suggested that I try it, and I resolved to stop giving up so easily, to keep my expectations alive, to expect more. This is a small example, but we should never lose sight of the undeniable fact that there is a very thin line, if any at all, between what we expect from life and what we get. If we're not getting what we'd like, maybe it's because our expectations are too low. Maybe we're suffering from the poverty of expectation. Your life will come pretty close to matching your expectations. It can easily exceed them. Higher expectations keep us trying. They keep us pressing upon ourselves. They keep us from giving up. When I was a kid, I remember hearing the words, if you don't expect much, you won't be disappointed when you don't get much. But that's just the problem. If you don't expect much, you're ruling out the chance of winning. The world is full of people who don't have much because they don't expect much. They're not trying for more, so how in the world are they going to get more? We should never be concerned about the opportunities we've missed in the past. There's no way on earth to make the most of every opportunity. It's almost never too late, and there will be just as many good opportunities in the future as there have been in the past. No one is without hope. Every person has expectations of some kind. But just as we tend to underestimate ourselves, we therefore expect too little. We have expectations, but are they high enough? As Goethe put it, in all things it is better to hope than to despair. It might be a good idea to take inventory of our expectations. Maybe we could use a new shipment. We become what we habitually think about. I read a comment in Forbes magazine by Henry George. He said the fundamental principle of human action is that men seek to gratify their desires with the least exertion. And there's the rub. That's the difference between what we say we want and what we're willing to settle for. It's like the high school kid who tells his counselor that he wants to be a physician and whose grades are C's and D's. Sure, he wants to be a doctor, but only if there isn't too much hard work involved. I've often thought that therein also lies the crux of the mid-career identity crisis so common among men. He wakes up one morning, usually a rainy Monday, looks at himself in the mirror before he showered and shaved and gets a world record sinking feeling. He's 40, and he suddenly realizes those insurance people know what they're talking about when they deal in mortality tables, and that there's one whopping disparity between what he's accomplished and what he used to think he'd accomplish. And often a very similar crisis happens to women. 
What happened, though, he wonders. Where did all those years go? And what's he been doing all that time? And more importantly, where's he going? What about all those young dreams? Voila, identity crisis. He's not the person he intended to become. And what happened was that he was comfortable. He had a job he could handle with raises along the way, three square meals a day, a family. These are not in the order of their importance necessarily. A house, well, actually it was what the other guys were doing too. And then those young dreams had been a bit amorphous, a little fuzzy around the edges. The thing is that while he may not be the person he intended to become, he's the person he settled for. He really has what he wanted after all. I had a call the other day from an older woman I know, and she said, you know, when I was a girl, I wanted more than anything to learn to play the piano, but my parents couldn't afford it. And there was a super private school I wanted to go to, but they couldn't afford that either. I asked her if she'd learned to play the piano later on after she left home. She said no. I reminded her that she could have learned to play every instrument in the Boston Symphony during the time she'd wasted since then. I told her that blaming her parents was the easy way out. People who love to play an instrument or seek a good education can do it one way or another, even if they have to teach themselves, as countless individuals have proved. So I won the argument and infuriated a nice woman. I had exploded a myth she'd been clinging to for 40 years, and I reminded her that there was still plenty of time. If you were given the opportunity to pass along to your kids one piece of advice, say you had only 30 seconds to say it, what would it be? I've always been interested in the advice parents pass along to their youngsters. In reading of an interview between Jeannie Sokol and Dr. Margaret Mead, which appeared in McCall's magazine some time back, the distinguished anthropologist and author, Dr. Mead recalled her grandmother as one of that rare breed of women who understood the nature of change and the need to be prepared for the unknown. And she said, this generation must discover how to bring up children to live in this unknown world, how to bring them up without absolutes. My grandmother taught me, she said, to nest in the gale, which is why I'm still around. The greatest gift we can give our children is to teach them to nest in the gale. I think it's particularly good advice for girls. Of course, this isn't something you just pass along as a bit of advice and then forget about it. It's something that has to be taught as a way of life, or as is any worthwhile philosophy. But it's a good one, isn't it? To nest in the gale, to be able in the whirlwinds of change and the tremendous upheavals that have rocked our world and will continue to rock it, to build for yourself and your family a calm, rock-solid place in the midst of it all. Like the seabirds that nest high in the storm-battered cliffs, to be able to have so secure a basic foundation that the storms can be weathered and the young can fly out at last to build their own nests when the time comes. This means teaching the youngsters that the only thing we can count on absolutely is change. Constant, never-ending change. And to understand that there is as much opportunity in change as there is danger. That courage and creativity can make a slave of change. And that change, however disruptive, holds the only hope for the future of mankind. If we're at last to conquer all disease, it must come through change. If we're to give every person on earth a decent, nutritious diet, it must come through change. If we're to have peace, if we're to tap at last the true potential of man to transcend himself, it will come through change. So change is not just inevitable. It's our only hope for the future. If young people look at change in this light, they will welcome it, knowing that they're going to have to take a few knocks along with the good. So as Dr. Margaret Mead says, maybe the greatest gift we can give our children is to teach them to nest in the gale so that they'll be able to fly in good health and clear skies when the gale is passed as pass it must. Peter Drucker, the well-known management consultant on the subject of getting into the right kind of work, has said, People worry because they think a career decision is like marriage, to be broken only by failure or death. Well, this just isn't so. You have to accept your uncertainties as normal. Only musicians and mathematicians and a few early maturing people, the number is very small, know from adolescence onward what they want to do. But the rest of us have to find out. Well, that's good. In the world of today, there are so many interesting opportunities, it's quite difficult for most people to make a perfect decision the first time. Perfect or not, it seems that most people largely do look upon their work as they might look upon marriage as a permanent thing. If it's not what a person happens to like, well, he often thinks that's just too bad. He's stuck with it. Well, not so, not anymore. 
I read somewhere recently that one of the tragedies of our educational system is that it often steers young men into the more acceptable or better known fields simply because it's easier to get them to conform to the curriculum than for the school to branch out into less popular studies. Thus, the young man who dreams of being an oceanographer or expert on pollution winds up being a lawyer or a CPA. But be that as it may, the person who dreams of more interesting, more challenging, and perhaps more rewarding work should ask himself quite seriously, and I don't mean more rewarding than being a CPA or a lawyer, that can be as rewarding as anything else, but he should ask himself quite seriously what it is that prevents him from fulfilling his dream. No matter what field a person chooses, there's always room. People in that field are getting older, they're moving up and out, they're retiring. If a person can think of the field he would like very much to enter, Chances are he can get into it if he's willing to make a few sacrifices. It might mean going back to school or starting all over at the bottom. But if he wants it enough, well, he can get into it. Remember, too, that it used to be that most people in most jobs were restricted to work in the country of their birth. Today, the whole world, or at least a big part of it, is available. Opportunities are literally everywhere. From A to Z, from aviation to zippers, there's a kind of work that can be congenial and interesting for just about anyone if you'll go to the trouble of discovering what it is and then qualifying for it. As I may have mentioned four or five hundred times before, the luckiest people on earth are those who enjoy and can find personal fulfillment and satisfaction in their work. As the man said, only musicians and mathematicians and a few early maturing people, the number is very small, know from adolescence onward what they want to do. The rest of us have to find out. An accomplished woman musician gave a great piano performance for a woman's club. Afterward, over coffee, an admirer from the audience gushed to the virtuoso, I'd give anything to play as you do. Whereupon the woman who'd given the concert took a sip of her coffee and fixed the red-faced, slightly perspiring matron with a cold gaze, and she said, Oh, no, you wouldn't. <laughs> well, a hush fell over the group. Coffee cups stopped on their ways to and from the saucer, and the culprit twitched in sudden embarrassment. Looking about as she repeated, but in a softer voice, her original statement, I would, too, give anything to play the piano as you do. The virtuoso continued to sip her coffee and shake her head. No, you wouldn't, she repeated. If you would, you could play as well. Possibly better, possibly a little worse than I do. You'd give anything to play as I do, except time, except the one thing it takes to accomplish the fact. You wouldn't sit and practice hour after hour, day after day, year after year. Then she flashed a warm smile. Understand, she said, I'm not criticizing you. I'm just telling you that when you say you'd give anything to play as I do, you really don't mean it. You really don't mean it at all. In the pause that followed, a napkin falling to the thick rug would have rattled the windows. The women looked at each other and then back at their coffee cups. They realized that this woman had spoken the truth. They would like to have her talent now fully matured and developed, but as for putting in the twenty years of work that went into the fashioning of it, no, that was a different matter. Soon the light conversation was resumed and the incident was glossed over, but not forgotten. People are forever saying, Oh, I'd give anything, but the fact remains that they don't. They give very little, often nothing, to do the things they say they'd give anything to do. The actor who envies the pinnacles reached by the stars, the small business person, the homemaker, the student, the golfer, the professional person, the aspiring writer, the painter, across the entire spectrum of achievement, the stars are those who have simply given their dedication, their singleness of purpose, their days and nights, weeks and months and years, and when the harvest they have so painstakingly sown and nurtured for so long begins to be reaped, there are others with the same time, the same opportunity, the same freedom, who come up to say, I'd give anything to be able to do what you're doing, to have the things you have. But as the pianist said, I'm just telling you that when you say you'd give anything to play as I do, you really don't mean it. You really don't mean it at all. Each of us has the time and the opportunity. If we say we haven't, we're trying to kid ourselves. Everybody ought to become great at something. What is it that you'd give anything to become? Well, then give it, and you'll become it. Sometimes it seems as though there are far too many spectators and not enough players. Maybe we're so busy watching the world and everyone else we forget we've got one of our own to win.